Yeah. You want to like them, but you can't. Are you listening? What? Are you listening? Did you bring me on this show to insult me? Yeah. Uh. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh. Yeah. Hey, y'all don't want it with us, uh. man. We straight gangsters over straight here, Straight gangsters. Ah. Uh. Uh. Yeah, it is Monday morning, and you are listening to Scout Team Sports. We are the Scout Team, bringing it hot each and every morning, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m., and again at 11 a.m. on 12 Ounce Sports Radio. I am one of your gracious co-hosts. They call me Loudbeard. You are the most egotistical, self-deluded person I have ever met. And all of that is true. And the man on the other microphone, they call him the Great Patriot. He is more America than America knows how to be American. America, America. Yeah, it's your boy Chris America coming to you live this Monday morning and every morning, Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. It was another great weekend of football, Loudbeard. I am pumped. I am ready to get this Monday started, but I'm also a little depressed because the season is almost halfway over for college football. We're already through five games, man. What is going on? I, you blink and it disappears. Uh, you, you get excited for it. You have this long, what, nine months of nothing, and then you, you're ready for it, and you have great weekend after great weekend after great weekend, and then all of a sudden you turn back and say, Oh my gosh, where did this go? Where, where did the, the college football season go? I remember the five weeks prior to college football dragging on, and this five weeks just blew right by. Oh yeah, it, it has been an absolute just, I don't know, flash of lightning this, this season. But that's okay, we're enjoying it, we're in the moment, we're living it, we're loving it. College football is hot. We had a lot of great games this weekend in college football. Uh, the only thing that disappointed me about this weekend is I didn't get all these upsets that I like to get. You know, we, we were talking about it ahead of time. I love the upset. There was a few upsets I was trying to predict out there, and I felt like this was the anti-upset weekend. I would what you, say wait, the, what are you talking about? The Florida Gators upset Mississippi State at home. They were ranked. Florida was unranked. The Gators went in there, punched them in the mouth. Dan Mullen got the win. Yeah, that was the only... <laughs> Pseudo <laughs> upset. I don't even, that, I don't even that's think, not even an upset because I'm, I I'm felt like sure Florida, Florida was, was probably better. Yeah, Florida was favored going into that game. I'm pretty sure Vegas had them favored. Yeah, you I, almost had one in Clemson. Uh, yeah, this is what I I've got to. I'm I'm just gonna throw this out where we're not even jumping into the the segment yet. But what are you? An idiot sandwich. I mean, I strongly believed that Syracuse was gonna upset Clemson. I believed it to the end of the world, and when it started happening, when it was halftime and Syracuse had a lead and they were almost dominating in a, in a fashion, Clemson, who's the number three team in the league, and I'm sitting there thinking, this is going to happen. Syracuse looks like the better team on the field. And then I'm sitting there, and oh, oh boy, oh boy. Hold on one second. I, I think I hear some interference coming in. There could be no. a spook... Spooky, no, no, spooky that, thing. That that was that was me. Oh, that was you. The little that feedback, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that was the golden ghost. I'm gonna try to summon him. Hey, I'm just here, so I won't get fined. Hey, I'm just here, so I won't get fined. I'm just here, so I won't get fined. Nope, it didn't work. He texted no me. No golden though. ghost. Just oh, he did. Yeah. He says every mm -hmm. ducking mo Monday, and I thought that meant he was gonna be on every ducking Monday. But instead, he's... I, I think he means that he's ducking Mondays. Like, he's trying to get avoid them. Yeah, that's ac exactly what he meant by that. And maybe he was just saying that because we're talking about the Florida Gators. He loves listening he, about the Florida Gators. He heard about the Florida Gators. Uh, such a great game. I know no, no outside fo Gator fan thought that was a great game. But for a guy that's been waiting nine long, awful years... I am finally just so glad to see a Gator team that is well-coached, that executes the game plan. Um, it was a boring game. 
the Gators had to run a very vanilla offense because the defense on the other side had seen all of Dan Mullen's play calls for the last nine years while he was at Mississippi State. Um, so he couldn't run anything but bubble screens and just let the athletes be athletes. It took a, a backwards pass to Tony, Kadarius Tony, to do a forward pass to Moral Stevens for the only touchdown of the game. But the defense looked good. The offense looked okay. It was a good win. It was a good, solid win. And did you see the end of the game? I did not catch the end of the game. Tell me what happened. Well, it was a 4th and 10, and um, hold on. it was a 4th and 10 play. The yep. Mississippi State was driving. They were down by, by 7, and uh, here's the final play, a call from Jim Ross. Jim Ross was at the game, and he called it. He is broken in half. Broken in half. Florida calls a safety blitz on 4th and 10, and Steiner just, nobody picks him up, just goes straight up the middle and utterly destroys uh, Fitzgerald. Would have made Clay Matthews blush. No flags because we don't have those ridiculous rules in college football yet. It was amazing. You you, got to see it. Check it out, man. I can't believe you didn't see it yet. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you tweeted that out, so I, I did maybe catch that part. I, I did not realize that was the very end of the game. I guess that's what it was. But the state of Florida had a great, uh, absolute great week in college football, maybe not so much in pro football. Now, we were talking about the Clemson-Syracuse game. That was going to be my upset special of the week, and I was this close, man. Clemson did not deserve to win that game. Syracuse just let it slip through their fingers. I would have loved to have seen that upset. What no, I'm but, getting out of this game, though, is Clemson is just not as good as we think they are. Is that what you're getting out of this, or do you you get a different take? No, that's pretty much where they're at, and this is where they were at last season. Last year, they dropped the game to Clemson, or sorry, to Syracuse, and then we gave them a pass. We let them cakewalk through the rest of their conference schedule, and we put them back in the playoffs, and then they got rolled in the uh, in the playoffs by Alabama. If Clemson gets put in again, I think that's just going to happen again. They have played nobody on their schedule that's of merit. I know we're we're hyping up Texas A&M and everything else with Jimbo Fisher, and that's an okay quality win, but is it really, though? Is, is Texas A&M there yet to where you can say beating them by two points and needing a fumble out of bounds and some bad bad coaching or, sorry, bad referee calls to win? Is that really a quality win for you? Nope, absolutely not. I, and you know what? Texas a and is a good team, but they are not a, a top 10 team. And when you go in there and you struggle mightily, like this is two teams now, both Syracuse and Texas A&M, that they have struggled against that are the, probably the two most quality teams on their schedule. Um, and I think as they, the season progresses, you're going to start seeing some of these deficiencies on this team. And I think Clemson is the most overrated team in the top 10 right now. And based on what I saw out on the field, I watched a lot of that Syracuse game, and it's a good team. It's not a great team. And great teams are in the top ten. They are going to lose a couple rough games here because their schedule's not that good. It's going to look like they're better than they are. But once they go up against any real competition, they're going to get punched in the face. And I don't believe in Clemson. I don't believe that they are one of these great college football teams. They're not like Alabama, who can go into a Louisiana University and make them look right. like a peewee team. Have a, I mean, have a powerhouse like Louisiana come into your home stadium and just utterly roll them. Yeah, they're not like that. Or Georgia, who beat up on awful Tennessee. They weren't like that. You're right. I agree, man. I, and on that note, the Alabama scheduling awful teams every year, man, that's got to get fixed. I, I get that you have a tough in-conference schedule, but the cupcakes are just so but, vanilla. But do, they, it's, mm. but do they really, though? I mean, when you think about it, I feel like the SEC today is the same as every other conference in that Alabama is only going to play maybe two tough teams, maybe three tough teams in conference that has a, a possibility of beating them, and everybody else, they're just better. When I look at Ohio State's schedule, it's the same same damn thing. Like, they Ohio State beat Penn State, and now who else are they going to play? Like, when Alabama beats LSU, who else is left? I mean, Auburn, maybe? And then who else is on their schedule that you sit there and think, 
yeah, this team is really, really, really good. This team is a solid top 25 team and can beat anybody in the nation and surprise anybody in the nation at any time. Nobody really has that on their schedule anymore. It, it, those those deep conferences like the SEC used to be 10 years ago or nine years ago when you had a, a litany of coaches that won national championship, when you had Philip Fulmer on your schedule, when you had Steve Spurrier on your schedule, Urban Meyer on your schedule, when you had that many championship winning coaches, less miles on your schedule, then you could say, wow, that's a deep conference. But now it's... Now you have who is on your schedule that you can beat. I mean, Texas A&M isn't there yet. We already discussed that. Tennessee's never going to be there for a long time. I don't know who Alabama plays on the other side. Mississippi State has just been rolled by Kentucky and lost to Florida. So is Mississippi State really anybody to write home about? I don't know, man. I think we need some more. We need more NFL streamlined schedule where you force teams to play each other. Yeah, definitely because they when they're picking teams to play on their own, these big big schools like in Alabama do not want anything to do with any challenges outside of their conference. They want these cupcake games, the Mercers, the Tennessee Middle Tennessee States, the South Alabamas, these are the teams they want to schedule. They do not want to schedule tough out of conference t- games. They just don't. I mean, you look at Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, Georgia, Notre Dame and Oklahoma, those are all like your top five teams, right? These are all the teams that we think will probably be in the mix for the playoffs down the road. None of those teams will play each other. How does that make sense that you have a playoff of teams where no teams play other playoff contending teams? Like, Could you imagine in the NFL where the Eagles or the Patriots played an entire schedule of just teams that won't make the playoffs? 16 games of teams that won't make the playoffs or even contend to make the playoffs it would be insane to think about a a schedule like that that it is it is utter insanity and uh, you brought up another point I just want to get your opinion on because I feel like you're going to like this Tennessee they're bad they're awful and it does not look like it will ever change does that make you feel good as a Gators fan knowing that Tennessee is still at the bottom of the the heap Yes and no. It's kind of a double-edged sword. You like seeing your team miserable, or sorry, not your team, but your rival miserable. But at the same time, it gets kind of old. I'd rather have them be number one and have like a, you know, a future Hall of Famer and Super Bowl champion like Peyton Manning, and you beat them four years in a row while he's there. So that way, you can remind everybody that when you had the Super Bowl Hall of Fame quarterback, they couldn't beat your team. That's a little bit more fun than just. Your team's kind of hapless and, and awful, and we just continue to, to beat you. Well, a rivalry that is not hapless is the Ohio State-Penn State rivalry. Uh, this was the game of the week for me. I got to watch this one, and it lived up to all of the hype. You got to see kind of the, the momentum swing in two different directions, and then all of a sudden at the very end, Ohio State pulls it off. And with the whiteout at home, Penn State, to me, had the advantage. Uh, There was some questionable play calling, that fourth and five. Hey, let's just do a – let's just run the ball, and we're going to do like a little option read, but it was an absolutely absolutely awful play call. I think that killed Penn State, and Ohio State was the better team, and they came out with the win, and I thought Ohio State would win, but this ended up up being a lot closer – when it came down to it, and Penn State played them tough. This was a great game. Uh, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, Penn State should have won this game. I'm going to bring up my Florida Gators again because that's what I love to do now that I can actually talk about them with a little bit of pride. I mentioned that safety blitz on 4th and 10. They brought the blitz the whole entire final drive for Mississippi State. They they didn't change up their defense. And when Penn State was up by 13 with like 8 minutes to go in the 4th quarter, they switched up their defensive game plan, and they did what most teams do when they're up big, is they, they switch it up to that soft zone, and they allow the offense to come back. If you're having success with whatever your defensive game plan is, quarters one, two, three, stick with it in quarter four. If you get beat, you get beat. You, you, you tip your hat to them. You say, okay, you finally figured this out, and you beat us. You don't switch up your game plan to some soft zone to where the offense can just sit back and pick your team apart and when you can't tackle, that makes the soft zone even worse. And that's what happened to them. They threw the ball into the hole of a soft zone. And then the guy just picked and bobbed and weaved and made his way to the end zone with one missed tackle after another missed tackle after a poor angle here, a poor angle there. 
And Penn State just let him come back. They should have never been in that situation on fourth and five. And then the fourth and five play call was so frustrating. And you know what game it reminded me of? Which one? Uh, the Oklahoma Georgia game where they took the ball out of Baker Mayfield's hands mm. on fourth down and they decided to go for a run. I, I don't understand. You have a quarterback who is by far the best player on your team. I think he had like 461 total yards of offense during the game. How do you take the ball out of a guy who has 461 yards of total offense? How do you take the ball out of his hands and give it to a guy that wasn't really doing much for you in the running game to begin with? Yeah, this that was kind of befuddling. Um, James Franklin, I've got a lot of respect for him as a coach, and I think he's doing a great job there at Penn State. I just thought that was a little bit of a poor judgment on him. And you know what? Sometimes these coaches make these these tough decisions, and, and they got to live with it. And he understands now. I'm sure he, he had trouble sleeping Saturday night after the, after losing that game, probably playing that play over and over and over again in his head. So he I mean, knows. he better be playing that game, or that play, he better be playing. Because this is the two years in a row now that he's allowed Ohio State to come back with a double-digit lead. I mean, that to me is, he's a great coach, but that's a telling sign that, or he's a good coach, but that's a telling sign that he's not a great coach. Great coaches put games away. Uh, last year, he had the, one of the best running backs of all time, and he couldn't put, put the game away with a running game with Saquon Barkley. This year, he has one of the best quarterbacks in the nation, and he can't put the game away with Trace McSorley. So he's got to figure something out. He's got four losses, I think, with a total of eight combined points for those four losses. He's got to figure out a way to put games away and put teams like Ohio State away. I mean, that's what's going to put him on that level with the, um, the, the Urban Myers and the Nick Sabans of the world. Now... You talked about have, being a, a good coach, almost a great coach, and then having a great running game. Last year, Penn State doing it with Saquon Barkley. This year, Kentucky is that team. You got Stoops over there making Snell Jr. look like an absolute stud. Man, this Kentucky team, for real. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm, I was not giving them the opportunity that they deserved. I was already thinking, okay, South Carolina was going to come in and upset. I was way off. But Kentucky, man, impressive. What, what, what do you think about this team? I again, we can get into this whole ranking system. Where did Kentucky end up? Do you know? If you can find that for me, let me know. I'm pretty sure they're, they're still seventeen. In the, I think so. They're seventeen. So they're five and zero. Oh. They're rolling. Oh wait, no, through. I'm sorry. They jumped up. They're right behind UCF. UCF's twelve, and Kentucky jumped to thirteen from seventeen. Okay, so they're up. They're up at thirteen right now. So Kentucky is at thirteen. Their schedule is. Is, isn't that great, but they're playing all of the same crap teams that Alabama and Georgia are playing right now. They're rolling through their schedule. They're beating uh, SEC teams. Somehow, Georgia and Alabama are ranked 1 and 2, and Kentucky's ranked number 13. Can we just stop this strength of schedule excuse now? Can we, can we just admit, can everyone just admit that your schedule has nothing to do with your ranking? That it's all about what my preconceived belief is of your team and as the season goes on I'm going to eliminate teams that lose and move teams up that win and that's all it has to do with and if you aren't a Georgia or an Alabama or an Ohio State I'm not going to change my mind on your team I mean you look at Notre Dame Notre Dame has played four uh, power five teams I don't I don't know if there's any other team in the country right now through five games that have played four power five teams and two of those teams are ranked in the top 15 that they've played in Michigan and Stanford. And they handled both of those teams fairly well. Michigan did come back on them, but I think that was, again, more of that soft zone. We have the big lead, so let's kind of you know play it safe. And that's, that allowed Michigan to bring it back within seven. But they rolled Stanford this past weekend, and they looked impressive doing it. And Notre Dame should be, if we're going with strength of schedule and scheduling matters and, and all that, Notre Dame should be in the top three. Yeah, oh man. Notre Dame has impressed me. They're usually typically the overrated team going into the season, but no, they're not getting the credit they deserve for what they've put out on the field. And uh, real quick to all of our listeners, I'm, I'm being haunted right now on, on Twitter. There's a golden ghost that keeps atting me. And I just wanted to say to all, our, all of our listeners, if you want to hit us up on Twitter, 
at Scout Team Radio or on Facebook or Instagram. We like to live tweet during the show. This Golden Ghost fella, he keeps calling uh, Chris America a hypocrite. Uh, this is interesting. Things are getting heated up here on the Twitter machine. So thank you, Golden Ghost, for reaching out and um, atting us here on Twitter live on the radio. We love to hear your feedback. He, he says that Franklin needs to get over the hump. Well, that's what we said, man. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Uh, he says Georgia's still the OG, and nobody's taking that away from Georgia. But to have Kentucky ranked 13th while they're playing the same schedule as Georgia means it's it's just how are, how are you separating the two teams? And it's all about my preconceived notion and what I believed going in. And, and I believe that, you know, stars and everything matter during the football season. It's great to have that in the back of your mind and you can rank Georgia ahead of Kentucky, but to have them so far apart in your rankings makes no sense. And it means you're putting no analytical thought into your ranking other than just, Hey, uh, this team won and that team lost. So I'm going to move this team up and that team down or this team lost barely to, or this team won barely to this team. So I'm going to move them down one and move this team up that blew out, you know, a, a non-ranked F or a non-ranked group of five school like Tulane. Mm. And it, you're preaching to the choir, my friend. I'm with you. I, I, the ranking system, it needs work, but we've been talking about that nonstop. Um, you mentioned Notre Dame rolling Stanford. Again, Notre Dame, man, not getting the credit they deserve. Now, on that Kentucky game, Snell has another great, great game. Now, uh, this is kind of too early to talk about, but in the Heisman conversation, I think he's got to be in it. I think he's got to oh, be no one doubt. of these guys. So you got Tua kicking butt over there in Alabama. We all know who he is and what he's all about. Former Gator legend Will Greer doing his thing in West Virginia. These are names that, that deserve to be on that list. But I think Snell, above them all, needs to be considered because he's taking a Kentucky team and he's carrying them on his back. And this is a Kentucky team that has not been that good for decades. So this is impressive. No, it is, and you failed to mention one name. Uh, M Mackenzie Milton? Yeah, Mr. Six-Man Touchdown. Two weeks in a row now he's thrown and ran for six touchdowns. That's 12 touchdowns for those who are good at math. And he did it against a Power 5 school. Listen, we know Pitt is an awful team. They're not good. But this is what the Georgias and the Clemsons and the Oklahomas do and pad their schedule with teams like Pitt. They have... Six to seven teams in their conference that are exactly in the same spot that Pitt is. And they say, look, we beat a Power 5 team and we rolled them, and that makes us look good. Well, UCF just did what all those teams I mentioned did. Pitt looked awful. The ACC referees looked even worse. Um, you were at the game. Tell me what you saw besides Pitt players falling down like, like they were soccer players. Yeah, the, the leg cramp seems to be pretty... Uh... I don't know. I, I, it was hot out. I, I'd have to give them that. I mean, it's like they said it was 108 degrees on the field. And up in, living up in Pittsburgh, you're not used to that kind of heat. No. So these could have been legitimate cramps and, and tightness and all that. But it looked pretty suspicious when it happens right when they're driving down the field. They're doing their hurry-up offense. And all of a sudden, a, a lineman is just standing there normal. And then he does the old swan dive into the grass. And you're looking there like, what happened? What, you, nothing, nobody touched you. You didn't do anything. You were standing there fine, and you just drop. So, it reminded yeah, me of the old Ric Flair where he'd get up and, and start kind of walking, and then he'd fall flat, face flat on the, on the mat. Yeah, like the, the dazed walk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, my leg. It cramped. It, oh, no. But yeah. it didn't matter. It didn't stop UCF. I don't even know why they thought that sort of thing would even remotely help them. UCF is an unstoppable force on offense but yeah you UCF would have blown out UNC as well it, it's just crazy yeah but, I wish they would have the opportunity to play UNC and the nice thing I saw about this pit game is the defense the defense was very stout um, they let one touchdown up which was a kick return so that's not on the defense that's on the special teams and the other touchdown was with like five minutes left in the game it wasn't even it was like in garbage time. So the defense was stout the entire game. And, and like you said, the offense, they're kicking it on all cylinders. Everything's looking good. Uh, and I talked about that early Heisman talk. There was another team that just blew the doors off of their opponent, and that was Oklahoma. Uh, Kyler Murray, 
This is like the new Baker Mayfield over here in Oklahoma. Seven TDs, and the guy doesn't even start because of discipline. But, of course, he doesn't start, what, the first series of the game? I don't know what I mean, what that sounds like Baker Mayfield. Yeah, it does sound that like sounds Baker exactly Mayfield. like is, Baker Mayfield. I mean, this is they 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 found another Baker and it was, Mayfield to fill in as Baker and, Mayfield. It's just crazy. And it was and it was against Baylor nonetheless. Because isn't yeah. that where he did the crotch grab, or it was before that game? It was something. I remember something around Baylor. He did something to cause scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, this is they found the perfect replacement for uh, Baker Mayfield in Kyler Murray, and this guy's also in the Heisman talks. I mean, we talked McKenzie Milton. Snell, Tua Greer, Kyler Murray's right up there too. I mean, we're seeing some some of the talent rise up to the top here in college football, and it's fun to watch. Uh, and I, I love it, man. I absolutely love it. One other thing, just talking UCF a little bit, I got to go to UCF's old coach, Scott Frost. Things are starting to get a little dicey over there in Nebraska. How long do you think the fan base is going to tolerate all this losing, man? This is not looking too too good for Scott Frost. 0-4. I think now the fan base of Nebraska knows that this is not going to be a good season. I think they kind of realized that maybe week three. I, th- I think going into Michigan game, they even knew like we're we're just going to get beat. Um, I, I didn't even know this, but I guess their starting quarterback got hurt, and they're now playing a walk-on freshman. So I think they they're kind of packing this in. They're kind of hoping that Scott Frost can just weed out all of these weak players who aren't buying into the system, who aren't wanting to play hard for the big red and I think I think this season's just kind of a write-off I think he has at least two seasons to turn this around if he comes out next year 0 and 4 or 0 and 5 yeah then the impatience will start but I don't think it comes this year well he comes out and he calls the team undisciplined um yeah now as a coach usually the discipline part is on you but he, he he's probably having a little bit of a challenge with the, these players we definitely need to see a couple more Scott Frost recruiting classes to come in there so he can make a difference. But I'm surprised he hasn't made an immediate impact because he took a, a really, really bad UCF team that was winless, and he brought them to a bowl game the following year, his first year on that team, and then undefeated. So Nebraska, I think, had high expectations because this is a guy that took a winless team and made it undefeated in two seasons. So now he has to take a Nebraska team that was bad – and make it a good team, and he's really just made it a bad team that's still a bad team. So he's got a lot of work ahead of him. I'm, I'm hoping he can pull it around because I like Scott Frost. He's a good guy. He did great things for UCF, and I think he is a great coach. I just don't think that this team, the the style of football that he plays is not really that mid um, Midwestern style of football where he's wanting these fast guys more of that Florida football style, and he's trying to take it up there. And it's just, it hasn't evolved to be what he thought it would be. But he can pull it around. I think he can pull it around. Yeah, he needs a couple of recruiting classes. And like I said, he needs to weed out those guys who aren't buying in. People don't understand how a football culture can affect the team. And if the culture is bad from what the previous coach did, and when I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about practicing habits, eating habits, play study habits, film watching habits, you know, game habits. Like if you have a ton of bad habits, it's hard for a coach to come in year one and get rid of those. And if players aren't committed to doing, changing those habits, you mentioned UCF and their 0-12 season. George O'Leary was still a very tough coach to play for. It's not like he was soft or Gave them bad practicing habits. I'd have to go back and reevaluate that UCF 0-12 season, but I don't believe that it was a losing culture that made UCF go 0-12. I think it was just maybe the message was lost on the players and O'Leary's old, tired, uh, you know, just outdated playbook just was just run ran its course. The AAC finally figured it out, but it, I don't think it was ever that George O'Leary practiced soft or gave players of bad film watching habits and everything else like that. I think it was more or less just scheme and just the message was tired and it was time for O'Leary to, to write off into the sunset. And he probably should have done it two or three seasons prior. Um, so, but it's different at Nebraska. Nebraska's just had nothing but losing season after mediocre season after a losing season where UCF just had that one zero and 12 season, but they weren't far removed from winning football. So they, they still had players on that team that knew how to win football games. Yeah, and 
I think that the ground and pound that the O'Leary did didn't fit the scheme or the players and the personnel he had. And I think Scott Frost has that same issue. He wants that that wide open. I need fast guys in. In Nebraska, they just don't have that personnel. Real quick, we got a quick commercial break coming up. I did want to mention Northwestern blowing a 17-point lead. Is this just the greatness of Jim Harbaugh, or is this actually Northwestern being just bad? I don't know. What do you think, Chris America? I think it's the greatness of Jim Harbaugh. They they went up 17 nothing. They had they were moving the football. Then halftime happened. Jim Harbaugh has made all the halftime adjustments. And that defense, the defense has always been good for Michigan. And when you see a team like Northwestern moving the ball on, it, on them, it's kind of surprising. So they made the halftime adjustments. And I think their second half numbers, I could be wrong, but I'm going to throw out this number here that I think it was. It was 47 total yards in the second half. To me, if you're executing on all cylinders in the first half and then you come out and sputter in the second half, that means the other team usually made the adjustments. I don't think a team goes into the halftime locker and forgets how to play football. So I think Harbaugh made the adjustments, and a lot of the, a lot of the plays that Michigan had in the first half, I think there was like a big big time run for forty yards that you know got taken back for holding. They were there in the first half. They just made a few mistakes, and they made the adjustments at halftime. And that's what you like to see from a, a good coach and a good team. And they got the win. Northwestern is not a bad team by any stretch of the imagination. Miss America during the first half was like, I can't believe we're losing to Northwestern. Northwestern's a bad team, blah, blah, blah. And I had to tell her, like, no, like Northwestern's been pretty good under their current coach. They've turned their program around. They're not that Northwestern that goes 4-8 and eight every single season. They're now a 9-win team, 10-win team every single year. And she had to look it up. She's like, oh, you're right. And I'm like, I do a sports radio show, babe. Like, come on. Yeah, come on. I mean, you're the expert. You're the Ryan Seacrest of 12 <laughs> Sports Radio. I am the Ryan radio. Seacrest of 12 Mountain Sports Radio. All right. Let's we're get a do commercial a, break. We're going to do a quick commercial break. On the flip side, we're going to find out if flicking off the, your sidelines is the best way to salute your team after a bad injury. When I'm working hard, I build up a thirst for sports. That's when I grab a cold 12-ounce sports radio. (sighs) 12-ounce sports radio. Quench your sports thirst. Oh, guess who it is. Did you know the station had a janitor? Oh, yeah, the Hefe otherwise known as Beck, and it's Beck's Work Week in Review live on 12 Ounce Sports Radio every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Catch interviews, special guests, and the recap of the week's news and headlines and box scores and results. It's Beck's Work Week in Review live on 12 Ounce Sports Radio. Scout team listeners and friends of the show, I've got something special for you. It looks like 12 Ounce Sports Radio has done it again. We have partnered with Rally House. You just go to the website, 12ozsportsradio.com. Click on the banner on the right side of the page, and it will take you directly to Rally House. Rally House has some of the greatest, most unique sports items for that diehard fan, casual fan, and anybody and everybody out there that is special in your life. So go ahead and check it out. Once again, go to that website, 12ozsportsradio.com. Click on the banner to the right of the page, and you will get taken to the best sports merchandise website on all of the interweb. Do you own a small business? Are you looking for solutions to all of your communications, problems, and challenges that you have? Check out Ring Central. Give them a call. They have partnered with 12 Ounce Sports Radio dot com to give you the best rates on all of your business and office solutions for communication give them a call today we have a dedicated line for all of the 12 ounce sports radio listeners it is 1-877-779-3860 you will get a representative on the phone who will help you with all of your small business communications needs once again give them a call today one 1- 
Yeah, uh, Scout Team is coming at you on this beautiful Monday morning. It is the 1st of October. Welcome, October. I love October. That means fall and autumn is almost here. For us in Florida, it means it may never come because it's always hot. But we love this time of year. Man, it is a great morning. We love being on 12 Ounce Sports Radio. We want to thank you all for listening in. If you're not listening in and you missed it, and you somehow I can telepathically get to you right now in your brain, you can always catch us again on the replay at 11 a.m. And if you're listening and you're like, man, I like these guys, where can I catch them? You can get us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or on our website, scoutteamradio.com. That's where we keep all of our old episodes, and that's where we drop all of our daily episodes. They come to you hot right after we record. So we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to listen to the Scout Team because, in my opinion, we are the hottest internet radio sports with two guys talking about sports in all of America, especially right now. Don't you agree, Mr. Chris America? I definitely agree. We have a good thing going on. We're growing every single day, every single week. What's going on at 12 Ounce Sports Radio is exciting. We got a lot of new shows, new takes, different voices. If you're tired of listening to the cowherds of the world, the Clay Travises of the world, the Skip Baylesses of the world, then give 12 Ounce Sports Radio a try. We're all a bunch of guys and gals who are trying to make it to where those guys are. And we're trying to just live out our dream, man. This is a passion of ours. We love doing sports radio. We love, you know, getting up every morning and and talking. If I didn't love this loud beard, I I wouldn't get up before work to do this. And I'm excited to do it. I can't wait to watch us continue to grow and watch 12 ounce sports radio continue to grow. Do you have the 12 ounce sports radio schedule available right now? Yeah, the schedule's looking hot. Um, let's see what we got going on. 8 a.m. Clutch Talk Sports. We've got at noon. College credit hour, and of course at 11 is our replay. Everybody already knows that, though. Um, Off the field coming on at 2 o'clock. Bourbon and Bad Opinions at 4. Stick and Rink at 5. Brunch with the Buds at 6.30. Vegas Squares, good friends of the show, 8 o'clock. We love those guys. And at 10 p.m., and that is 7 p.m. on that Western time zone, whatever you call that, that is the Primetime Angle Show. This guy's out He does a lot of his shows out in Las Vegas. He is a professional sports gambler, and this guy, he knows everything there is, and he gives some really hot takes. So I definitely recommend checking out the live primetime angle show at at 10 p.m. tonight. So great lineup ahead of us here on 12 Ounce Sports Radio. A lot of great shows. A lot of these shows are, are sports podcasts that are really taken off that we've brought onto the station as a lineup. There are also a lot of great live shows where guys are just experts in their field, like the Primetime Capper with Primetime Angles. And this guy knows what he's talking about. We love to see that on the radio station. And you know what, Chris America, I teased that little bit of uh, giving the salute on the sideline. But before I jump into that, I'm going to do – let's do a little quick baseball talk. I, I figure if we go into NFL, we are going to run out of time and we're not going to be able to give baseball the justice it deserves – yeah, but I need to talk a little bit about baseball. We have got the NL Central. There's actually going to be a 163rd game. This is a playoff. Cubs versus Brewers. After all of these games this season, they come in tied, and they don't know who's going to win the NL Central. Playoff game today to see who wins it. And then we jump tomorrow into wild card games. NL West, same thing. Dodgers, Rockies. They're coming in hot. and they, They're tied they're- as well. They are tied as well, and they've got to see who wins the NL West. So we've got two playoff games coming at you today. And you know what? Tons of talent on these teams. Christian Yelich, who I've mentioned on this show quite a bit. I mean, this guy's looking to get the triple crown. It's like the first time in the National League, and I I don't even remember the number. I think it was like since 1919. But he's got right now the batting title locked up at 323. Got it. He's only one home run behind Rockies Nolan Arenado. So he's just one home run behind, and he's two RBIs behind the Cubs' Javier Baez. Now, all three of these guys are playing today, Yelich, Baez, and Arenado. But if things fall into place, we might be seeing a triple crown for the National League in Christian Yelich. And if we don't, 
we're still watching an MVP player because this guy's the, the MVP. And for our old friends at Basement Sports Report, this is my crew, right? We got to represent. These guys love the Brewers. And the Brewers right now, they're one of the funnest teams to watch. I got to love it, man. I got to love it. Yeah, they're 9-1 and one right now in the last 10. And so are the Colorado Rockies. Those two teams are going into the playoffs hot. That is exactly where you want to be going into the playoffs is on a winning uh, streak or just like a win, you know, culture. Whereas, you know, I mean, Cubs in, in L.A. aren't doing as bad. I mean, L.A. 7-3 and three the last 10 and 6-4 and four for the Cubs. But two wild card or not wild card games, but two divisional one game playoff. It's kind of like playoff golf where you watch, you know, four rounds of golf, all these different holes, and you got to go down to, to one last hole to, to kind of decide it all. It's going to be exciting. And are we officially making Milwaukee Brewers our, our, our team to root for for the NL? I'm going to say yes. Now, right. if they it's, end up not squeaking through in the wild card and, and we have to watch other teams, then we're no, going to pick somebody else. But no, the they're in the wild team. card. What are you talking about? They're in the wild card. I know, but the wild card's that one game. Oh, yeah, 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 the one game where, playoff. Yeah. And I feel like after that one game playoff's done, that's when we can jump on a team because then you actually get a full series. You're when tr- you have yeah, that that's true. one team playoff, ugh, that's that, – I don't. I still don't like that. I, I we'll save that conversation for another day. Um, you're right. You're right. Charlie Blackman also hits for the cycle. One of the Rockies' great stars, and you're, like you said, the Rockies are on a heater. So it, it, either the Brewers or the Rockies, eh, Dodgers and Cubs. We've seen that show. We've been there. I want to see one of these new teams, Brewers and Rockies. These are the teams I want to see. All right, man. That uh, that's it for baseball. I'm not going to dive too deep. We're going to have some results over the next couple days when we get into the playoffs, so we'll have plenty to talk about. But Earl Thomas with the one-finger salute to the sideline. A lot of controversy behind this. If our listeners did not hear already, the Seattle Seahawks uh, safety, Earl Thomas, he's kind of sat out most of the, the preseason and all the training, and then he came in, and he's been in this little bit of a dispute with the Seahawks because he wants a better contract. And he decided not to hold out and come and play. And he hasn't been practicing, and he goes out, and he plays. And what happens? He breaks his leg on the field. He has to get put in an air cast. And as he's being rolled out on his golf cart, it looks like he flicks off the sideline of the Seattle Seahawks. Now, I don't see where he would need to flick off his teammates, but maybe the coaching staff or maybe the general manager was sitting over there, and maybe he was just saying, you know what? Screw you, I should not have played. You should have paid me, and now see what happened. Uh, you, I don't know. Do you believe that he actually flicked him off? It, it looked kind of shady, shady, like just his hand was up, but a couple of his fingers were a little, little crouched, and maybe his middle finger was standing a little bit taller than the other ones. I don't know. What do you think on this story? Yeah, I doubt he was saying you're number one to all of his <laughs> teammates. I doubt that was what he was doing. Um you know, this is why I said that Le'Veon Bell should hold out and wait for uh, an actual contract instead of playing on a, you know, a uh, franchise tag. This situation's a little bit different as he was under a current contract. He was under a really good contract for his position. It's not like he wasn't getting paid, you know, a top dollar. I mean, he was making $8 million a year each year for the last four years. He had his guarantee money in. So I kind of, you know, I, I get him wanting to hold out and everything else. But when you're under a contract and it's actually a good contract, it wasn't like he was under a rookie contract or anything like that. Earl Thomas got paid under this contract that he was under. And, yeah, it sucks that, you know, he's not going to be able to get his next big contract. But I don't know what you want teams to do, especially if they want to move away from you. No team's going to give them what you want trading for a guy that's under a one-year contract without guarantee that you're going to sign with them long term so that's kind of like a a hard you're stuck in a hard place you're stuck between a rock and a hard place kind of deal so i get his frustration though i get it man you you want to have job security you want to have contract security and money security the rest of your life and you want to get as much out of this nfl well as you can and he feels like now he got cheated out of some of that some of that money. Yeah, and these bad injuries, they could be career-threatening. Now, his, I don't think, is career-threatening.
But there was another really bad injury this oh, uh, yeah, last Eifert. week in the Eifert one. Now, I saw the headlines, gruesome ankle injury. I did not, I, I saw that you could go back and watch it. You know, some of the links were there online. I didn't go back and watch it. I, I, I am, I'm a little queasy when it comes to that stuff. Sometimes it's just hard to miss it because I remember watching Paul George's injury live when he was playing USA Basketball. I remember seeing what happened to uh, Gordon Hayward. I remember the the guy for Louisville, Kevin. I can't yep. remember his last name. And these are so gross. I didn't want to deal with this with Eifert. I don't know how bad it was. I'm assuming it was it was like Gordon Hayward's, where maybe the foot twisted around. But yeah, man, I watched, these gruesome injuries are hard I, to watch. I watched this one on the Red Zone channel. It it was as bad as all the ones you mentioned. His ankle got rolled up. We've seen this a thousand times. You know between wide receivers and uh, offensive linemen get rolled up on their legs. And it was like it was like all the ones you mentioned. He was sitting there, you know, on the field with his legs spread out, and one ankle is sitting up and down, you know, vertically like it's supposed to, and the other one was laying to the right side. Uh, totally unnatural. It was, it was pretty gross. Yeah. I don't know why I even brought it up. I'm, I'm already <laughs> regretting this decision immediately. Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, let's but, talk about but, real football, though, like injuries aside, right? Yeah, let's let's get onto some good stuff. And you know what my takeaway was yesterday, Loudbeard? Let, let's hear it. This was this is one of the most fun NFL seasons we've had in a while. A lot of times you hear people say the NFL is as is as close of a league as it gets. All the teams are you know razor thin apart, and sometimes that's true. But most of the time, that's a little bit of an overstatement. I think this is the most. A competitive league or NFL season we've had in a very long time. We had three overtime games yesterday. Three and not of a them. Single tie, thankfully. And, oh my gosh! Yes, thank you, Tennessee's coach, or not Tennessee's coach, but Indianapolis's coach for going forward on fourth down. A lot of people ridiculed you, but not Chris America. Chris America likes a real man, a man with some cojones, to go for the win instead of settling for the tie. We've said it before. A tie is like kissing your sister, and if you settle for kissing your sister, you're disgusting. Wow, that's that's quite the image there, Chris America. Thank you for bringing that part up. Uh, yeah. Speaking of my sister, uh, she was actually my sister was at that Tennessee Eagles game, which was overtime. She flew down to Nashville. You know, she's a big Philly fan. Uh, her and her friend who likes oh, to burn man. our houses down. They actually was, were at that game. I was wondering why there were some houses burning in Nashville last night. Oh, yeah. They were ready to burn the city down. And, you know, that was a, a game where the Tennessee coach did go for it on fourth down. They went for it on fourth down. Uh, I believe it was three separate times on that drive. Mariota just owned the field and knew what he needed to do and was so clutch. And instead of going for the, the field goal at the end, they, they decide to go for the win. They want to go for the jugular. They decide to go for the win, and they get it. And everybody's like, oh, man, Tennessee's so great. They went for the win. Great win for Tennessee. And like you mentioned, on the flip side, Indianapolis was like, hey, we've only need, we only need four yards. We have got Andrew Luck. If we don't get this, yeah, it sets them up in great position, but we don't want to play for a tie. So Frank Reich over at uh, Indianapolis, he's like, I'm going for it. And afterwards at the press conference, he said, 10 out of 10 times I'm going for it. I'm not playing yeah. for the tie. I'm playing for the win. And this is a football guy. I yeah. love this. I, That's, you and I both talked about this, right? We love this. We love a football guy doing a football decision a football and decision. doing it for the win. Go not a it, soccer man. decision. Not a soccer decision where you play for a tie. You don't get one point for a tie. You go for the win. You make sure your team knows that you have their backs. You, Especially, he's a new coach, right? This is his first season? Yes, it is. So you gotta you gotta know right away as a coach, hey, I believe in you guys. I trust in you guys. And now... I think from here on out, this Indianapolis Colts team will run through a wall for this coach. People are so short-sighted with their NFL and football takes. It's it makes me disgusting. Like you're gonna sit there and praise Tennessee for doing something because it worked. If it didn't work, you'd be giving Wright the same treatment, or the you'd be giving Tennessee's coach the same treatment that you're giving Wright. It's so stupid, man. Like have an intelligent thought. Stop being so reactionary and just. Whatever happens, you give a positive review, and if it's a negative play, you give a negative review. Start thinking for yourself, guys. Like, come on. Yeah, I 100% with you, sir. Now, you mentioned there being three overtime games. There was more than just three overtime games that were exciting. You've got the Andy Dalton-led Cincinnati Bengals 
with a, a last minute heroics to get a touchdown to beat the Falcons. That didn't yeah. go into overtime, but that was a thriller, man. I mean, this that was is a Michael back Jackson and forth game. Right here. This is a back and forth game. This is going to be a league where um, I mentioned how close and competitive it is. There are several teams like the Falcons who are one and three that I believe are playoff teams that I believe are not out of it that can definitely bounce back. I was looking at all these one and three teams in the NFL right now, and I'm thinking, man, these are not one and three teams. Usually, you are what your record says you are, but. It's just these guys are just playing other good teams to start out the season, and they're losing close. And, you know, it's going to be a fun, exciting season to see which one of these one and three teams. Another team that is not one and three, I think they're one, two, and one now, is the Pittsburgh Steelers last night. That's another team that Ooh, should be one and the Browns. Well, them two. The Steelers should be one and three, um, but they're not. They're one, two, and one, basically one and three. They could be a Super Bowl champion down the road. Yeah, they have the offense to do it, but their defense, uh, their defense is awful. And you know what? The Ravens, they were impressive. I was watching this game. I did not give the Ravens the credit they, they deserved. This is a, a number one defense. And, I mean, holding the Steelers to 14 points, that offense with Big Ben and with Antonio Brown and Juju Schuster-Smith or Juju Smith-Schuster – this is a high-powered offense. This Ravens defense, to me, is what was impressive last night. And I, I kind of brought up the Browns. I, I, we talk a lot about the Browns on this show. Nick Chubb he has three carries for 105 yards and two TDs. Why did he only have three carries? Did something happen to him? Did I miss something? Why? A, a guy is that electric? Why would you not hand the ball off to him a little bit more? Yeah, they got to get him more involved. I thought when they drafted Nick Chubb, Later on in the draft, after picking, picking Baker Mayfield, and everybody gave him crap for not taking Saquon, I was like, you know, Nick Chubb might not be the next Saquon Barkley. He won't give you everything that Saquon Barkley will give you, but he is about one tier below what Saquon Barkley is and what you draft, what position you drafted him at. I'm not sure where in the draft he went, but I know it was much later than pick number two. Where they got him at in the draft was of a great value. That's kind of like, I don't know, picking up, Christian McCaffrey in the second round as opposed to drafting Saquon Barkley, you know, with your second pick in fantasy football. It's just, yeah, he's not going to get you as many consistent points, but you know you got a good pick for the value and you got better players. I, I mentioned in our, our our scout team account tweeted out, I'd rather have Baker Mayfield and Nick Chubb than just Saquon Barkley. And right now, you know, I mean, they're pretty much the same record. They should have won that game last night. I mean, Cleveland had that game wrapped up. They had the Raiders on the ropes. It's just Raiders were a desperate team needing a win. They were at home. They they needed they couldn't go down 0 4 and you know, sometimes you get caught up in that. And the fourth pick that the Browns took was Denzel Ward, who is one of the top rated rookie uh uh second uh, secondary players right now. Right. So, they actually did a great job drafting this year. You know a guy that's under the radar that got, was drafted early in the draft that should have gotten more credit than he deserved is Calvin Ridley, man. That guy's having a, a, a phenomenal first quarter of the season. I mean, six TDs in the last three games. Uh, it, and it's surprising he's an Alabama player. You would think he would not be coming out of left field. I don't think anybody had him hyped to be one of the top offensive weapons this year. And he's lighting it up over there in Atlanta. No, he is. And um, just so many big-name players. I think I counted... With wide receivers, there was like six or seven wide receiver or eight wide receivers out of 14 games that caught over 125 yards of receiving. It's just the amount of offense we're seeing. I think at before halftime in the first uh, 1 p.m. games, there was 24 touchdowns. I know everybody loves good defensive battles, but I think this league is much more fun than the old nine to six and a cloud of dust football games. Yeah, you're not seeing that many 100-yard rushers anymore. It's all on the receiving side. The running games, there's a few 100-yard rushers when you have Nick Chubb with three carries for 105 yards, but not nearly what you're seeing in the passing game. All right, man. I mean, we're, we're, we're still, I mean we still got Ezekiel at 152, Sony Michelle 112, Marshawn Lynch, the ageless wonder, man, 130 yards yesterday, Alvin Kamara doing his thing. Lots. Of, there's still a lot of good talent all over the field, man. There is. Oh, man, this thing went, went by in the blink of an eye. It is it almost did. that time. Um, do you have any parting words or any last thoughts that you want to share before yeah, we close this sucker up? 
Yeah, one running back that couldn't get over 20 yards was uh, Connor over there at Pittsburgh. There's yeah, they could definitely use hole. Le'Veon Bell back. Big hole over there, man. Oh, you can't skip the throw on fourth down. But, hmm. hey, listen, it's just the system, right? The system made Le'Veon Bell good? Yep. System? Mm, system. Nope, I think it's him. I think it's Le'Veon Bell. All right, well, we didn't get to Monday motivation. We'll give you Tuesday motivation tomorrow. I got a good one. We ran out of time again because Mondays are just so jam-packed with football, and we love it. We do love it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening in. Yeah, man, I got some Jimmy Johnson rolled up, ready to go. Ooh. Ah, I miss those days, man. Jimmy was a fun coach. Tuesday motivation. I can't wait. Just sucked that he was on uh, the Cowboys. Mm, true. True.